I am holding the newest member to the family of mango cultivars. When a person creates a new cultivar of mango, he gets to name it. And I am naming this one after my grandparents, the Balliot. In this video, I'm going to tell you what it takes to create a new cultivar of mango, a little bit about this specific new one, and then I'll tell you why I chose to name it after my grandparents. To most people, a mango is just a mango. But those of us that are in the game, us tropical fruit nerds, we know that there is huge variety in mangoes. Take a look at the difference, the difference in size, the difference in shape, the difference in color. We as farmers are always looking for new varieties that maximize in all those metrics. Does the fruit taste good? Does the fruit look good on the shelf? Is it resistant to disease? Do the trees grow fast? Do the trees grow large? Do the trees produce a big crop? Do the trees produce a crop every year? So what's so hard about coming up with a new variety of mango? Nothing. All you have to do is plant a seed and wait 10 years. This tree behind me, this is another new variety of mango. This variety has never been seen before and it'll never grow from a tree again. I haven't even bothered to name it. I just label it seedling variety. Why? It fails on just about all the metrics we would use to select a new variety. What am I gonna do with these little, these little, I don't even, these little marbles. What am I gonna do with these? What makes this variety that I've named the Balliot different than this seedling variety I just talked about over there? For starters, this tree I'm standing under is the tree that gives the Balliot. And this tree produces every year. And every year this tree is full of juicy, delicious, large mangoes. Second thing I want to call to your attention is they stay a lot cleaner as they ripen. This Hayden is ready to eat, so is this Balliot. Notice the Hayden's a lot more stained up. The Balliot has a little bit of staining, and frankly, I was a little lax with spraying this year. If I was more vigilant about spraying, this thing would be even cleaner. But this variety is just naturally a lot cleaner than the popular Hayden. They're also very appealing to the eye. As they ripen, they take on this nice peach color, and I find one side tends to get a little orange and red, and the other side tends to light up as yellow. So already we know the tree grows big and strong. It produces a healthy crop every year. The crop is not as susceptible to the molds and funguses that affect mangoes as other varieties are. It's also early season, which means I could start picking and shipping these in the month of May, as opposed to my Naomi's, my Valencia Pride, my Kits, my Ford, my Raposos, which we start harvesting in July into August. And in the case of the Fords, we don't even pick till September. So if you're someone who has a backyard with a lot of late varieties, the Balliot variety would be a good alternative to give you some earlies. But all of those positive attributes don't mean a thing if your new variety of mango doesn't taste good. And it so happens that this variety is delicious. Now the Glen, it's delicious too, but look at how small it is. It takes about 20 of these to fill me. But one or two of these Balliots and I'm done for at least an hour. Look at that beautiful flesh on that guy. Oh, mmm. It's got a classic, classic mango flavor. Tastes a little bit like a very sweet orange juice. Has a little bit of a peach flavor in it. Very little fiber. There's a little bit of fiber in my teeth, but negligible fiber. I would say it's like a very low on the scale as far as fiber goes. Mmm. That one I just ate was significantly bigger than the one I'm using as the example here. But let me weigh this one because this is probably... The one I just ate is probably a, a little bit of an anomaly, a little bit of an outlier liar on the bigger side. And this one here is probably a little bit of an outlier on the smaller side. So this guy's in the, the Goldilocks zone, right in the middle, just right. So let's just weigh this one here. Yeah, that comes in at two pounds. And I'd say that's pretty good representation of uh, the weight of these. And something that a backyard grower wouldn't care about, but us uh, pros, uh, also the shape, see it's kind of wide, but it's also narrow going that way. This is very good for packing. Boom, 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 boom. You got six of them in a box, that's 12 pounds, away you go. Now the thing about this, you got to understand if you haven't caught on yet, is that when you plant a mango from seed, every tree gives you a different tree which gives you different fruit. So if I want to propagate this, I can't just take 
the seed from inside of this fruit, plant it on the ground, wait 10 years and get a fruit that gives me more of these. But imagine if I could just take a cutting of this tree, snip and grow this into a whole tree. Well, the good news is we can do that. And that's what grafting is. We could take this and we could take that seed that's left over from this mango and I could plant it in the ground. And when it gives me a little seedling that gets to be about 18 inches high, I come out and take a cutting from this and prep it and I fuse this into that seedling. And the seedling stops growing up and if it tries to grow up, I'll just prune away the growth. And I will only allow growth out of this cutting to continue to grow up and out. Which means I'm not only getting an identical genetic match, which is gonna produce this same exact fruit, but since it's already sexually mature, I don't have to wait 10 years. I only have to wait two to three years for my tree to start producing fruit. And another cool thing I get to do, that tree I just showed you that's producing this nasty seedling crap, I can go to that tree and cut it back and prep it so that it starts throwing out little shoots, maybe eight or nine little shoots. And I could take eight or nine cuttings off of this tree and fuse them into that already mature tree, like at about this height, like with the big old stump. And I can take that tree from a seedling no-name tree and train it to start growing the Balliot variety as well. And that's exactly what I'm gonna do. Now is not the time of year to do that, but when I do, I'll be back with another video showing you how I do that. If you're someone who's a grower, if you're someone who's a gardener, if you're someone who likes to get outside and plant stuff, and you happen to live where mangoes grow, which is USDA hardiness zone 9B or higher, then get out there and try this. Plant yourself a bunch of seeds and wait the 10 years and see what those trees give you. You're gonna have to go through a lot of mediocre and even subpar quality fruit. I keep throwing these for dramatic effect. Until you find yourself a winner. But know this, every single person that went before you and found a winner followed exactly that process. If on the other hand, that process does not sound appealing to you and you'd rather just get the fruit and eat it, then go to guacfarm.com, G-U-A-C-F-A-R-M.com. That's where we sell our mangoes when they're in season. Then I've got this avocado grove behind me here. We sell our avocados also from the months of late June into January, February. We have our t-shirts, we have our hats, and sometimes we also have specialty fruits like lychees, Monstera Deliciosa, Mame, whatever happens to be ripe and I can get my hands on and ship to you guys. Before I end this video, and heck, if you wanna listen to me tell this story while you go to guacfarm.com and shop for some tropical fruit, I wanna tell you why I chose to name this mango cultivar the Balliot. Why I chose to name it after my grandparents. And first of all, there's something about me, um, the way I process thoughts. When I see a word in my head, uh, an image forms. And the word Balliot uh, has always brought a lot of color to my head. Um, I know this sounds weird, but certain words feel bland to me. Other words feel smooth, other words feel rough. Uh, my grandparents named Balliot, or if you're fancy, Ballier, uh, always like put a splash of color in my head. I, I don't know if it's the B or the double L, there's a, there's a lot of vowels in it, but it's, it's just a, my brain likes the word. And, I, and, I, and, and, and it, it kind of connects with mangoes for me because mangoes also give me an explosion of, of color and flavor and pleasantness in my brain when I eat them and, oh. That, that's the kind of feeling I get when I think of my grandparents. My grandmother and grandfather were very influential people in my life and they were kind of late in, they had my mom late in life. So by the time I was born, they were a little older and my grandfather lost the ability to walk. So he was always sitting in his chair and I, as a little kid, I remember playing with matchbox cars, playing with Legos, sitting on their uh, wall to wall carpet. I can even remember how it smelled, you know? And uh, he would tell me about finance because that's what he was into. My grandfather actually did get a higher education. He went to what they call the Wharton School. Now, I don't think that's the Wharton School of Business that's at the University of Pennsylvania today, but they are from Pennsylvania. So I'm guessing like back in the 19 teens, 19 early 20s, there was probably some other type of business school called Wharton. I'm thinking it's maybe the same name that morphed into Wharton School of Business 
at UPenn. I've Googled it. I've, I've never been able to get an answer, but it, it doesn't really matter. You know, my, my grandfather was always known for being like an intelligent guy. And even as a little kid, he taught me a lot about money. He taught me about interest. He taught me about savings accounts and investments and the dangers of borrowing money and how much better it is to have your money working for you and gaining interest rather than spending it on frivolous things and just burning it up. My grandmother, on the other hand, grad, uh, graduated, quit school in eighth grade to go work topside in the mine. So while her dad and brothers and uncles and male cousins were all down under the ground mining the coal, it comes up in cars and comes down these conveyors and it was my grandmother's job to sort the coal into different sizes so it could be trucked away or you know put on a train and sent for whatever purpose that particular size of coal was meant for. Uh, they, they didn't have easy lives. All their older brothers got sent off to World War I. And the ones who made it home got home just in time to go through the Great Depression. And then the Great Depression ends and then their younger brothers all get sent off to World War II, you know. Uh, so these were people who knew hardship. I mean, when, when daddy, when uncle, when whoever went down into the mine, you didn't know if he was coming back that day. Or sometimes he wasn't coming back with all his fingers or all his limbs. And in fact, my namesake on the other side of the family, Thomas Siddons the first, like my great, 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 I think, grandfather, maybe there's another great in there, died in a mining accident. So, was, you know, they lived with, uh, you know, constant insecurity, constant threat of disaster. And yet there I'd be on their carpet floor as a kid I don't ever remember my grandfather complaining once. I don't ever remember my grandmother complaining once. The woman never drove a car. My grandfather lost the ability to walk at age 50, and I never heard them complain. They had their brothers taken from them and killed in World War I. Their brothers taken from them and killed in World War II. They had to go through winters with no heat in their house during the Great Depression. And 30, 40, 50 years later, they were nothing but positive, smiling, helpful people. And I respect my grandparents, and I admire my grandparents. And my hope, my hope is that this new mango variety, the, the Bally, my hope is that it catches on. I mean, what if it catches on? What if it catches on like the, like the Haas avocado? You know, in 70, 80, 90, 100 years from now, people are buying these things and eating them. And it's named after these two wonderful people. I think that's a great way to, to, to say thanks and to give back and to set up some type of something that'll go into perpetuity. So I'm gonna work very hard to propagate this tree that's this tree right here. Like I said, within the next couple months, I'll have 14 more of these growing here on the farm. And as I make space, I'm gonna continue to plant more. And remember, while I only have one tree of these, so supply is limited right now, I got tons of these and even more tons of avocado like I said earlier, you can get those at guacfarm.com. G-U-A-C-F-A-R-M.com. Now for me, I, I think tonight I'm gonna go in the house, I'm gonna just put on some music and close my eyes and just sit back and think about my grandparents. You know, today I, I named a variety of mango after them. And I think I'm just gonna give them the rest of the day in my mind, just put some tunes on and, and think, about, think about the time I had with them. While I do that, you go to guacfarm.com, and I will see you on the next video.